Hi, welcome to ESI 412, Nanotechnology, Materials, Infrastructure, and Safety. I'm Professor Uk Chung Nam at the Pennsylvania State University. So uh, uh, this is the outline for today's lecture. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, wet etching and then paper paste etching and then uh, dry etching. So uh, um, there are four uh, basic uh, processes uh, for the top-down approaches and then uh, that is uh, uh, lithotherapy and then deposition or growing or uh, material modification, uh, which is uh, modifying the uh, surface or kind of uh, uh, doping the materials or things like that. So we call that kind of processes as a material modification. And then the etching is one of the um, techniques uh, we need to use uh, for the top-down approach. So uh, uh, before we go to the uh, uh, talk about the etching, uh, let's talk about a little bit about the terminology we are using in etching. So uh, for etching, um, we will need a mask. So uh, we need uh, um, to transfer uh, some of the design to the substrate. Uh, we uh, like an uh, optical lithotherapy. Uh, we want some some area of the substrate just to uh, remain non-etched and then some area is etched. So uh, that purpose we need a mask. And then uh, for the mask, uh, we can use a uh, photoregist uh, as a mask. And then it uh, depends on uh, your um, etching staff. Um, if that material is kind of very tough to etch, uh, you might also use a uh, hard mask. Uh, this mask made of uh, inorganic material. So the uh, etch rate is um, um, the speed uh, you are removing some materials. So that's the etch rate. And then the etch selectivity is um, if you have a mask material A and if you wanted to uh, etch away material B, the etch rate ratio uh, of the etch rate of A versus etch rate B, this ratio is the etch selectivity. So uh, in most of the cases, uh, we want to have an uh, infinite etch selectivity, so we do not lose any materials uh, from A, but we just uh, etch, remove uh, B materials uh, very fast. So uh, that's the etch selectivity. And then uh, during the lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, isotropic and then anisotropic. But the basic idea is an isotropic etching is on the etching direction is all the same. So uh, um, it is happening during wet etching. So uh, the etch profile after uh, finished etching, it has an all the, the etch kind of a distance is kind of all the same. And anisotropic etching is an um, one direction of your substrate is preferentially uh, etch more. So uh, that is a uh, directional etching. We call that as an anisotropic etching. So this is the example of the iso isotropic and anisotropic etching. But uh, most of the cases, uh, wet etch uh, process offer you uh, this kind of isotropic etching and then dry or plasma etching uh, gives you this kind of uh, anisotropic etch profile. But uh, when you use uh, some kind of a single crystalline uh, substrate like an, uh, silicon, you can achieve anisotropic etching using wet etch process but uh, that's because of uh, depends on the uh, direction of those kind of single crystal. Some direction has a much denser uh, atomic arrangement to another. So that is why that causes this kind of anisotropic etching. Uh, when you use a, a very, um, if, you, you are, if you are using a, a very small bias on your uh, dry etching, 
uh, you can also have uh, this kind of uh, isotropic etching and then depends on the gases you are using uh, you can also achieve this kind of uh, isotropic etching out of the dry etching as well so uh, let's talk about the uh, what is the wet and vapor paste etching so wet etching is an um, it's kind of a pretty simple and easy and fast and economy. So uh, if you have uh, one proper container, for example, if you wanted to uh, etch silicon dioxide deposited on silicon wafer, you don't need a uh, capital uh, equipment uh, to do this kind of uh, etch step. If you have an, uh, a fume hood, and then if you have a proper container, uh, which is a Teflon container, if then you just simply put uh, etched chemicals into the uh, containers and then just simply put your samples into the uh, uh, <clears throat> chemical container and then if you just wait, uh, your uh, silicon dioxide film just gradually uh, removed. So in a sense, it's kind of a simple and easy and economic and fast. And then one good advantage out of this uh, wet etching is that um, uh, it offers a very high etch selectivities. So this wet etching is purely depend depends on pure chemical reaction. So that is why its etch uh, selectivity, uh, if you just find the right combination of the uh, chemical etchant and then those kind of masking material, its etch selectivity is kind of pretty high. And then since it does not use any kind of physical uh, plasma or those kind of uh, ions, so it does not have any physical bombardment on your substrate. So uh, uh, those kind of substrate you have does not have any physical damages uh, on it. The disadvantage is that uh, it is not reproducible. So uh, even uh, with using the uh, same kind of uh, concentration of the uh, chemicals, uh, your etch rate could be different depends on uh, the room temperature. A little bit of the variation of the room temperature will vary the etch rate. And then uh, based on how uh, much uh, you are using the same solutions over and over again, at some point uh, you will need a uh, kind of a fresh chemicals to use. So those kind of uh, uh, the freshness of the uh, etch chemicals also will vary those kind of uh, etch weight. And another biggest problems out of this kind of wet etching is um, in most of the cases, uh, it is an uh, isotropic etching. So uh, it has a, a pretty big undercut under the, your mask structure. So um, if you want to use this kind of a wet etching for the nano feature size like 100 nanometer or so, it is not reproducible and then it also has an undercut. So uh, it is not a reliable uh, method to uh, make some kind of a nanoscale uh, structures. And then the last disadvantage out of the wet etching is that uh, this one uh, produces a lot of uh, chemical waste. <clears throat> so this is an example of the uh, materials and then uh, its etchant. So uh, uh, for silicon dioxide, uh, hydrofluoric acid, or um, the mixture of uh, this kind of chemicals uh, used for the, uh, this kind of um, uh, material etching and then uh, depends on the different kind of materials there are different kind of chemicals are used. Um, there are vapor paste etching is also available but uh, it has an advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is an uh, it is a the etchant is a vapor paste, so it does not need uh, any kind of a bias or it does not use any kind of a plasma. Uh, for example, this genome fluoride uh, genome fluoride is an at the room temperature it has a pretty high 
vapor pressure. So uh, uh, what happens is that uh, when you uh, this genome fluoride uh, etch is a silicon, so when you put uh, silicon vapors with the genome fluoride gas in a closed environment, what happens is that this, this genome fluoride gas, this fluorine just uh, combined with the silicons and then uh, using these chemical reactions, uh, this genome fluoride gas uh, etch away uh, this kind of a silicon uh, substrate or samples. Uh, this genome fluoride uh, rely on the chemical reaction, so it has a pretty good uh, etch selectivities out of uh, other materials like uh, silicon nitride or photoresist or silicon dioxide. The interesting thing is that uh, silicon dioxide has a uh, silicon in it, but the bonding between silicon and oxygen is so strong, so uh, it's kind of uh, very hard, this kind of fluorine uh, steel silicon from this kind of silicon dioxide bonding. So that is why uh, this genome fluoride, the silicon dioxide has a very uh, slow etch rate out of this same kind of a gas. So uh, where we will have good advantage out of this kind of a vapor phase etching, there are two areas uh, people might be excited to use this kind of a genome uh, fluoride. Uh, those kind of two application is both for the uh, sacrificial layer, sacrificial application. So um, there is a, some kind of a, a project like um, this is a top view. So let's say somebody else wanted to have this kind of a channel structures. If then on the side view, uh, people wanted to have on, for in this example, people put this kind of a silicon bar structures on glass substrate, and then during the following uh, dielectric deposition process, this one could be another silicon dioxide. Uh, people can just uh, deposit everywhere with the silicon dioxide. Once people just uh, make an openings uh, in each of the end of the uh, channel, uh, people can uh, remove uh, this sacrificial layer and then the place those kind of a sacrificial uh, material was located to be an empty a space and then uh, it's going to be a, a channel depends on the uh, width or uh, thickness of this kind of uh, bar structures that could be a nano channel so the problem is that uh, you can do uh, this kind of etching step uh, both uh, wet and this uh, vapor phase uh, when you use a uh, wet etching what happens is that uh, in the initial kind of etching step, closure from the opening of this kind of channel openings, its etch rate is kind of maintains. Its kind of etch rate is kind of pretty fast. But uh, if this kind of channel length is kind of uh, more than uh, 500 micrometer long, at some point there is uh, some kind of congestions between the uh, fresh chemicals get into the uh, channels and then. Uh, those kind of uh, uh, chemical reaction byproduct also should diffuse out from those kind of uh, reaction happening. So those kind of uh, congestions are uh, getting more severe as your uh, dimension of this kind of channel is kind of much smaller. In another word, if your dimension of the nano channel is kind of a nano scale, then this kind of congestion is kind of getting uh, worse. So at some point, uh, your etch rate uh, started to getting slower and slower because of that kind of a problem. In the case of that, uh, if we are using uh, this kind of a vapor phase uh, etchant, uh, this kind of vapor uh, phase etchant is a uh, form of gas. So uh, it's kind of a, it has a much more kind of a space to move in and then diffuse out. So that is why uh, it can maintain uh, its original etch rate through the very deep inside of the channel. So uh, you can keep the very uh, steady uh, um, etch rate using this kind of a vapor phase uh, gas uh, etching source.
Uh, another application is uh, if you uh, somebody wants to make this kind of uh, uh, freestanding structures, uh, which use uh, sacrificial materials underneath. So let's say this one is a uh, uh, silicon nitride cantilever, and then uh, we use the uh, silicon as a sacrificial layer. Since there are op the openings are, are too big, we will not have this kind of uh, uh, congestion problems that I just uh, discussed be uh, just a couple seconds ago. But what happens is uh, when you are using a wet uh, process, uh, after complete the wet etching process, you need to rinse those kind of samples under the, uh, some kind of DI water and then uh, eventually need to um, dry your samples after uh, complete that uh, etching process. But in the case of that, while you are drying those kind of uh, um, samples out of, for example, DI water, uh, as those kind of a DI water is kind of a getting uh, dried off, those, um, if this is the bar, uh, freestanding, and then let's say this is the floor of, this, of your structure, as those kind of uh, DI water uh, will uh, be, uh, as, as the samples are getting dried, will be a one big kind of a drop. And then as you just keep drying it, these kind of bubbles are getting smaller, and then uh, it just uh, remained underneath of your freestanding uh, bars. And then eventually, those kind of liquid will be removed. But while these kind of liquids are removed, actually, um, when a liquid are present only under the bar, those kind of capillary force of the um, liquid just to keep pulling down your freestanding uh, structures down to the uh, structure. So uh, if your structure is kind of a big, like a micrometer or kind of a 500 micrometer or those kind of a big structures, and then if your um, uh, thickness of the freestanding structure is kind of a, uh, thick enough, if then uh, those kind of a, uh, um, capillary force pulling down from the liquid can be uh, negligible. But if the freestanding structure is uh, nanoscale, like um, 100 mic nanometer and 100, uh, about 30 nanometer in height, if then those kind of a capillary force uh, from those kind of a liquid uh, is a, a major factor to break down all those kind of freestanding uh, structure, in this kind of an uh, application, when you are using this kind of a vapor paste uh, etching gas, uh, you don't have uh, this kind of a problem. So that could be another kind of a big advantage uh, you can take out of this. But the problem of this uh, gas paste, vapor paste etching is an, uh, those kind of a selection of the material, kind of etching material versus uh, the etchant material is kind of a pretty uh, limited. So that is why uh, if you want to uh, do uh, some kind of a gold or platinum etching using this kind of a same technique, um, there is no uh, available materials uh, to do the same thing uh, like on genome fluoride with uh, uh, silicon. So that's the kind of a material limitation is our, our biggest problem out of this approach. So uh, we will move on to the uh, dry etching process. So uh, we will talk about uh, DC and RF plasma. So uh, let's talk about the DC plasma first. So uh, to create a DC plasma, uh, we have uh, this kind of a two uh, electrode facing each other and we will apply a high electric field between these two electrodes if then and then uh, if we just to uh, flow uh, reaction gas those kind of electrons coming out from one electrode and then uh, move to another uh, the other electrode and then while this kind of uh, 
free electrons kind of traveling from one electrode to another, it just make collision with neutrals uh, that are neutral of this kind of reaction gas. So that will make this kind of ionization. And then um, at some point, uh, the depends on the degree of the ionization, uh, you will uh, generate the plasma. So this ionization, uh, this is the original um, electron, produce another electron, which we call that as a uh, secondary electron. So this secondary electron also uh, collide with uh, neutrals, and then uh, it will cause another kind of ionization. So uh, the process itself is on some kind of avalanche-like processes. So uh, those kind of secondary electron just to keep ionize uh, those kind of uh, uh, gases, and then that's the uh, reason why once the plasma is uh, generated, uh, the plasma is maintained. The recombination is a reverse uh, process of the ionization. So uh, by that kind of a collisions, it just lose ions. Um, and then there are uh, three other um, processes happening uh, once those kind of plasma uh, was generated between the two uh, electrodes. But uh, this plasma, uh, when you use this kind of a diode type of the equipment, it has uh, some kind of a sweet spot to generate uh, the plasma. So uh, if your um, chamber pressure is too low, if then uh, there are very few numbers of neutrals available uh, to make the ionization. And if uh, your pressure is kind of uh, too high, if then the chamber itself is kind of uh, too much crowded. So that is why uh, those kind of uh, collisions are not happening um, efficiently. So uh, you will need to apply much higher uh, voltages. So at this kind of a sweet spot, uh, we will need only very few, uh, very small electric field to uh, generate the plasma. And then, um, so uh, for this kind of um, uh, diode type of the plasma source, uh, those kind of uh, power between the two electrodes and then pressure should be remained in a certain ranges. Um, RF plasma is an actually, uh, in, it is an, uh, just in you know, a two electrode instead of the one DC plasma. If you are using the RF plasma, uh, those kind of polarity of the electrode is kind of keep changing. Depends on the frequency you are using. Um, at some point, the ions uh, cannot follow uh, those kind of uh, frequency changes because of those kind of uh, I mobility of the ion is kind of much smaller than uh, the mobility of the electrons. So, uh, uh, but electrons still can follow those kind of frequency changes. And at some point, it just started to build up uh, charges uh, to the electrode. So it may just have uh, this kind of uh, if this kind of area is kind of the same, it has this kind of symmetric uh, potential build up. So uh, if you uh, just make one electrode structures smaller than the other, uh, it has uh, this kind of uh, inversely uh, proportional um, relationship. So uh, when when you have uh, one small electrode and then the other electrode is kind of pretty big, the charge density of that small electrode is kind of much bigger than uh, the bigger area of the electrode. So that causes this kind of uh, asymmetry of these kind of uh, uh, potentials. So eventually, it causes some kind of uh, 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 net bias uh, like a DC plasma does. So. Uh, 
uh, using this kind of a way, uh, we can go actually the RF plasma is kind of much easier in terms of kind of generating plasma. So when people use an uh, RF plasma, uh, people can use a little bit of uh, high uh, vacuum condition. So uh, uh, that's the one of the reasons why people like to use an RF plasma. And then uh, one of the uh, drawback of the DC plasma is um, uh, those kind of, uh, you cannot put insulating materials on top of the electrode because if then you can make the circuit, the electrons cannot flow to the other electrode because of this kind of insulating materials. So this can be a problem when you are sputtering some kind of uh, silicon dioxide or those kind of uh, uh, materials, uh, insulating material. We will talk about this more during the next lecture for the uh, deposition. But RF plasma, uh, since it will form those kind of self bias, so it doesn't. It can uh, working with this kind of insulating material. So that's the uh, big advantage and one of the reasons for using the RF plasma. So uh, uh, let's talk about the plasma reactor. So uh, uh, the most simpler kind of a configuration of those kind of reactor is uh, uh, in one chamber. Uh, those kind of two parallel electrodes are facing each other. So in this kind of a diode type plasma, uh, no matter what there is on uh, RF or DC, uh, it just uh, uh, generate the plasma applying the bias between the two electrodes. But uh, this way, uh, since the plasma are only generated when you uh, apply bias between the two electrodes, so uh, if you wanted to uh, apply very small bias on your substrate, it is not possible because uh, for certain uh, electric field you want to apply, uh, you, you cannot generate the plasma. So there is a threshold voltages uh, you need to apply mandatory to, pl to uh, ignite the plasma. So uh, that's the one of the uh, big drawback out of this uh, configuration of the reactor. And then uh, this type of the uh, mechanism to uh, generating plasma is not efficient. So the plasma density, the density of the ions are pretty uh, low compared to the, uh, the other kind of uh, uh, reactor. So uh, people uh, started to use some other, uh, some other uh, configuration. So uh, using some other kind of a configuration uh, that could be an inductively coupled plasma or electron cyclotron uh, resonance plasma, people can separate uh, those kind of uh, power supplies to generate the plasma. And then uh, people put another kind of a power supply to draw those kind of uh, ions into the substrate. So that way, uh, people can apply very small bias uh, to the substrate. And then uh, using this kind of an approaches, people can uh, generate much higher, one or two order higher um, density of the plasma. So uh, uh, when people use a uh, high density plasma, uh, it, it offers good edge selectivity because uh, it, use, it can use a very small energy of the ions. And then since it has a much high density plasma, so it's actually it's kind of a faster. And then it's, con it's control for the anisotropic etching is kind of much easier. And then uh, since it, it can use a very small bias on your substrate, uh, it can uh, reduce the, uh, those kind of a physical bombardment with the high energy of the ions. So uh, it can reduce the physical damage by the ion collision. And then uh, that is the um, same uh, meaning. Since it is good for the anisotropic etching profile, so that is why it is kind of a very ideal for uh, making nanoscale structures.
So uh, inductively coupled plasma is the uh, one of the most famous type of the high density plasma source. So uh, it has an uh, own chamber. It has a dielectric window, like a quartz window, and then it has uh, this kind of uh, coils. This is a top view. So coils passing like this. So uh, as we uh, apply uh, a bias, as we flow the current through this kind of a coil, uh, those kind of magnetic field is induced, and then eventually uh, that uh, field uh, generates the plasma. And then uh, for generating this plasma, we only apply the bias on top of the chamber. So your substrate has a zero uh, bias. So uh, since uh, we have an, uh, one independent source to uh, generate this kind of high density plasma, if we wanted to uh, use some of the ions inside of the uh, plasma, we can just uh, um, apply another kind of a bias on your substrate chalk. So you can just uh, apply as small bias as you want. So that's the one of the big advantages out of this. The ECL plasma using this kind of a, a magnetic coil. So this one is an, uh, from the top. It's something like a big donut-like structure. So using this kind of a, a magnetic coils, uh, you will generate the plasma inside of this um, chamber. But the thing is, um, uh, in terms of the uh, density of the plasma, ECL and then ICP, uh, it just produce almost a similar density of the plasma. But the reason why people are more favorable to this kind of ICP type of the plasma is um, uh, as people use a uh, much bigger uh, substrate size, this kind of a plasma should be also uh, the size of the uh, this chamber should be bigger to uh, have a, a very uniform plasma. So uh, to make this size bigger means uh, this kind of a magnetic coil should be also very big. So um, that is getting heavier and then getting more expensive and then um, that's the kind of a drawback. But when you use an ICP, uh, the only thing to increase the uh, size of the plasma, what you need to do is uh, just to use a little bit bigger chamber with a little bit uh, bigger uh, windows, and then you will have a little bit more number of the tons of the coil, and that's it. So it's kind of much easier to uh, expand the size of the plasma. So it can be, it can cover uh, those kind of a bigger size of the substrate uh, with a much easier way compared to the ECR. So those kind of a PCBD or those kind of a dry etching tool uh, are made out of this kind of an ICP based configuration for the commercial production. Another option we can choose is um, instead of putting this kind of a coils, uh, we can just put a permanent magnet around the chamber. So the basic idea is um, those kind of a magnet, permanent mag magnet uh, produce those kind of magnetic field. And then when we apply certain magnetic field inside of the chamber, what happens is um, when uh, electrons uh, just move one side to the other, instead of this kind of electrons traveling straight by this kind of magnetic field, it can just move like this kind of a helical pathways. So comparing this with this kind of a straight path and then this kind of a helical um, path, uh, this path is much longer than this kind of a st uh, straight uh, distance. That means uh, this kind of a longer traveling distance will cause much more kind of a, uh, possibilities of the collisions. So it will uh, directly connect it to the 
higher density of the plasma generation, higher ionization of the gas. So uh, this is magnet or magnetic field is um, uh, used for that kind of a purpose. And then uh, the permanent magnet is on another kind of an options people can choose. Vapor cooling is kind of a very important because uh, without proper vapor cooling, uh, those kind of a chemical reaction cannot be controlled. So uh, this is the kind of a um, chalk people used to use. But uh, before this, uh, people use uh, cooling water. So people has a, a substrate and then just to pass the cooling water and then just to keep cooling down this um, substrate to chop. But what happened is um, uh, when you use this kind of a water uh, cooled uh, substrate, uh, this kind of a substrate chalk and your sample is kind of a contacting one solid plate to the uh, one solid uh, substrate. So that is why those kind of a contacts are not uh, perfect. So what people are thinking about is uh, instead of using this kind of a cooling water, if people are using this kind of a high pressure uh, helium gas, if then uh, this helium gas is on gas form, so that is why it can contact your substrate much uniformly. So it can just cooling down the substrate much efficiently. So um, we are applying this kind of a high pressure of the helium from the back. Uh, we need uh, something holding your sample mechanically. So uh, this is your substrate and then this is a clamp ring. So this kind of a clamp ring just to, uh, holding the edge of the sample. But this kind of uh, uh, notches uh, making some kind of a mark after you are finishing your etching. So the next version uh, right now used for the tools right now is uh, instead of putting this kind of a, a physical clamp ring, people just apply a very uh, small electric field uh, to hold those kind of a substrate. So using that way, uh, people can remove those kind of a, a physical uh, clamp. So uh, let's talk about the materials and etching gas. So um, depends on the materials you want to etch. There are different kind of uh, uh, etching gas you can use. Uh, if you don't have any clue what kind of etching gas you, you need to use for certain material you need to remove, the easiest way you can uh, first thinking about is uh, just thinking about what kind of a compound is available out there. So like um, for the, if you want to etch the silicon, there is a uh, uh, silicon uh, fluoride is kind of available. And silicon chloride is available. That means fluorine and then chlorine can be an etching gas for silicon. So you can just find the uh, gas which has on fluorine and then chlorine is kind of uh, uh, involved. So uh, for the silicon, CF4, that is uh, all having a, a fluorine. And then uh, there is a chlorine, is, can be on another kind of uh, uh, etching gas. So uh, this is what happens uh, when you are etching your samples uh, in the plasma. So uh, this is a reactive neutral species uh, that is, an, uh, we call that as a free radical because this kind of uh, uh, chemicals, molecules, are not uh, present as a stable form. It was kind of uh, broken by those kind of collision with an electron. So uh, um, it's kind of a chemically uh, very unstable. So uh, uh, those kind of uh, molecules are very uh, reactive upon it sees some of the reaction material. So uh, ion spaces are coming down. So sometimes it just uh, enhanced helping those kind of uh, chemical reaction by applying those kind of physical bombardment of your sample. And then uh, 
is sometimes uh, reflected and then just to uh, etch the side wall as well. And then if you put some kind of inhibitor uh, material, you will form some kind of uh, residues on the side wall. So it will improve the um, anisotropic uh, etching, the direction of the etching profile. Uh, there is a, a process parameters. One is a, a process pressure, and then a temperature, substrate temperature, or a gas flow rate, and its mixture uh, combination of the mixture uh, of the etching gas plus, plus inhibitor, and then uh, the bias the power you are applying to the substrate is another kind of a factor. So uh, one of the rule of thumb deciding this kind of a parameter is on when you are using very high electric field on your substrate, it is a, a more likely a physical sputtering because those kind of ions are landing on your substrate has a much higher energies. When you reduce the process pressure, those kind of a mean free path, those kind of ions can travel much longer distance without any collision. So it does not lose any uh, energies by the collision. So it just maintaining has its original kind of uh, energies to before the bombardment to do your service trait. So when you are using a, a low process pressure, uh, that is a more likely a physical uh, etching. As you are uh, putting and, and if you are just reducing the temperature, uh, it just to uh, uh, suppress those kind of chemical reaction on the uh, substrate that is also uh, encourage this kind of physical sputtering and then all the other side of the directions. <coughs> Uh, promote a uh, more likely a uh, chemical reaction. So a uh, high pressure and then low uh, electrical bias and high substrate temperature, all those kind of a uh, parameter change <coughs> will induce more kind of a chemical, uh, ba chemical based uh, etching process. So uh, to the anisotropic etching, uh, depends on the selection of your gas. Uh, when those kind of ion species coming down, it just uh, bombard the vertically to the side wall, and then some of the uh, particles just reflected, and then just forming some of the residue films. And then uh, since this kind of a vertical side is just to keep. Uh, removed by this kind of a physical bombardment. So uh, no matter what this kind of a residue films are formed or not, it is kind of a keep removed and then you can just uh, uh, keep just etch through one direction. So uh, uh, this cartoon shows on, uh, the role of this kind of uh, uh, additive gases. So uh, you can use uh, CF4 or those kind of a carbon fluorinated uh, gas to remove the silicon. But uh, what happened is an, instead of using just a pure uh, CF4 gas, if you are adding hydrogen mixed with this kind of a CF4 gas, what happened is on those kind of hydrogens also like fluorine. So, uh, this kind of hydrogen started to steal some of the fluorines available. So uh, since this kind of fluorine is consumed by the introduction of the hydrogen, so uh, there are fewer numbers of the fluorines available uh, to make the chemical reaction with the silicon. So that eventually uh, reduced the uh, etch rate of the silicon. If you put too much hydrogen uh, with this kind of CF4 gas. If then all this kind of a fluorine, available uh, reactive fluorine molecules, just uh, stolen by this kind of hydrogen. So instead of you are uh, etching the substrate, 
you are technically depositing uh, this kind of uh, carbon fluorine uh, films on a substrate. So those kind of carbon fluorine uh, based films and Teflon films are based on that kind of a combination of the component. So uh, if those kind of uh, ratio of the gas are not uh, well controlled, uh, you can deposit some organic materials on a substrate instead of uh, etch away. Instead of the hydrogen, if you are adding oxygen, uh, it is kind of much helpful for, uh, for removing this kind of uh, uh, carb uh, residue films because the oxygen uh, just bind with the carbon and then it just keep removing carbons with such a form. So uh, in this case of that, uh, those kind of uh, uh, polymer residue, uh, the thickness of the polymer residue is kind of much thinner than uh, just a pure CF4 plasma. So that is why if you add too much uh, oxygen gas, uh, those kind of etch uh, profiles becomes uh, getting more isotropic. So uh, this is the uh, two different scenario when you use a CF4 gas only and then uh, hydrogen only. So in this kind of uh, uh, proper concentration of the hydrogen additions, uh, we can just control this kind of a rigid film formation on the side wall properly. So that is why we have uh, this kind of a very vertical side wall. So uh, this is the one of the two extreme cases. So uh, somehow, like um, you added too much kind of uh, hydrogen to the CF4 gas. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, residue polymer is kind of uh, growing uh, very fast. In this case of that, this side of the samples is kind of uh, keep removed by the ion bombardment. But if this kind of uh, polymer layer uh, growth rate is kind of uh, too fast to the uh, side wall, after one cycle, as, as you just keep etching away, this kind of a side wall, those kind of film thickness is kind of getting thicker and thicker. So it ends up with this kind of a very uh, angled uh, side wall slope angles. So in this case of that, uh, you may just control the addition of this concentration of the hydrogen or adding oxygens using that kind of a way if you just reduce the uh, the pigeon speed of those kind of a uh, uh, polymer layer if then you can achieve much directional anisotropic etching uh, i have a question so the way we deposit the inhibitors by using the spin coating or no actually what happened is on cf4 uh this fluorine we already know will make this kind of a, a reaction byproduct, right? But this carbon uh, does not um, make, actually, uh, it is not used for uh, any kind of a compound making this kind of a silicon. So uh, uh, it just to uh, uh, keep accumulated oh, on, on the, the yeah, on the side wall. So, uh, so that is why uh, we wanted to use oxygen we add oxygen gas so to remove are, this kind of carbon. Yeah. They are just amorphous carbons sitting on the sidewall. Right, actually the organic film is all amorphous, so not crystalline. So uh, yeah, that could be a silicon carbide, but those kind of a reaction uh, is not happening at this kind of a temperature conditions. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's another kind of a problem. So. So uh, this one is uh, one of the example. Actually, um, I used uh, ICP reactor to do this uh, etching step. So uh, this is a silicon wafer, and then I used the chromium as a, a hard mask. So I used the uh, same uh, 
ICP power to generate the plasma and then I use the same kind of a bias on the chalk and then same process pressure. So when I use this much of the CF4 plasma uh, gas and then this much of the SF6 gas, after 80 seconds of the etching time, I have uh, this much of the undercut, which is on about 223 nanometer. Uh, if your kind of a structure is kind of a big, like a 10 micrometer or that kind of a structure, those kind of a, a 0.2 micrometer is not a big loss, so you can just minimize. And then uh, when you just increase the CF4 gas a little bit more and then reduce the SF6 gas a little bit, this kind of undercut reduced to the almost half. Right now it is on 130 nanometer of the undercut. Everything, every etch conditions are the same. I only change the gas flow rate. Actually CF4 makes those kind of residual film on the sidewall, but SF6, the sulfur does not make those kind of a film. So when you are using the pure SF plasma, uh, it just to uh, uh, generate very close to the um, uh, etch profile you can achieve from the wet etching. So SF plus, SF6 plasma just to make an isotropic etching. So as you just to keep reducing uh, this SF6 uh, gas, uh, the your capability of the isotropic etching is kind of getting smaller and smaller. And then uh, as you increase the CF4 gas, there are more possibilities to making those kind of uh, uh, polymer layer deposition on the sidewall. And then that's the one of the secret. Uh, this kind of undercut was much smaller than before. But uh, if we are using, actually this condition is kind of much better in terms of the uh, anisotropic etching. So if we use this kind of uh, uh, etching conditions to our uh, nanostructure, if then what happens? Uh, this is the same, uh, this is a sample positions on the same substrate. So for this one, those kind of a chromium layer, it is a dot and then it's a 100 nanometer diameter of the dot. So this is the same conditions we used here. So as you expected, if you have a 100 nanometer dot, and if you have an undercut 100 meter from here and another 100 meter from the other, you will lose the support. So I think this kind of a flakes is the some kind of a flakes of those kind of a chromium hard mask. So you just simply lose your kind of a a support. So um, those kind of a sidewall control, those kind of a anisotropic etching is kind of a very critical as your dimension is getting smaller and smaller. So let's go uh, this kind of a trend uh, further. So uh, uh, this condition does not work for my nano pattern. So I just further increase the flow rate of the CF4 and then further decrease the SF6. I see some structures. So uh, I still have this kind of a chromium patterns uh, still there. This kind of a diameter is on about 95 nanometers. So that's your close enough to the 100 nanometer in pattern. But uh, this edge profile is not vertical. So if I just keep doing this, uh, now I increase the SF6 to the 45 and then reduce the SF6 to the 5 SCCCM. As you can see, it's uh, almost perfect verticals. And then from here to here, I have the same diameter, 100 nanometer, under the uh, mask and then under the uh, after 400, 35 nanometer below, the diameters are still maintained. If I etch a little bit longer time with the same conditions, 
it just keep uh, edges away but still uh, have a very beautiful side wall vertical side wall so uh, those kind of effect or control of those kind of a side wall is kind of a getting more difficult as you are working with uh, those kind of a nano size patterns and there is a uh, some uh, kind of a mic loading effect so uh, uh, this kind of a loading effect is happening uh, when you are using RIE or DRIE the RIE uh, it's kind of a plasma density is kind of pretty low the RIE it has a separate run to deposit those kind of polymer film so that is why uh, these kind of two techniques cause this kind of problem this kind of macro loading effect is uh, very critical for the RIE so what happens is um, if your uh, sample has a different kind of an area to be etched those kind of a bigger area is actually this kind of a, uh, getting smaller and smaller that's because as those kind of etched area is getting bigger uh, those kind of um, etched spaces uh, reactive etched spaces are locally kind of a depleted so that is why that causes uh, those kind of etch rate uh, decrease if you are using the uh, same kind of a dimension of the uh, pattern but if even though you have this kind of pattern in one single substrate if one area the density of the pattern is kind of a much denser than the other if then it also has the same kind of a loading effect so those kind of a denser uh, pattern area is actually this kind of a much is, uh, slower than those kind of a isolated pattern area so uh, that's so um, if you have a uh, this kind of a mixed kind of uh, uh, patterns on your substrate and then if you are using the RIE uh, this kind of uh, edge depths the nano cavity depths are not even uh, the aspect ratio effect uh, this one is happening uh, more severe when you are using the RIE uh, I will talk about the DRIE a couple slides later uh, it is not clear why this thing is happening but uh, for some etching step usually happening when you are using the DRIE those kind of a small patterns is actually is kind of a much slower than uh, big patterns so people say for this one uh, this is a totally reverse trend uh, what we discussed just before so uh, in this case of that uh, those kind of uh, uh, rigid formation is kind of too fast so uh, it is not effectively removed uh, for this kind of very small feature size so those kind of uh, non-effective uh, rigid uh, removal can cause this kind of a slower etch rate for this kind of a small uh, cavity formation and this is the one of the example of this so uh, uh, just to simply compare in 2 micrometer versus 50 micrometer it has this much of different kind of uh, <clears throat> depth if we go further to the uh, nano ranges it is much smaller so what happened is um, uh, when you wanted to etch this kind of a nano cavity uh, you cannot it's kind of much easier for your kind of uh, using this kind of much bigger sample size because it's much easier after you uh, do the etching it's much easier to analyze uh, how much uh, materials were removed so uh, you can simply if that is on some kind of a, a bigger than micrometer range you can simply use a profilometer to uh, measure 
uh, this kind of a high tall depth or things like that. But if you are using this kind of a nano feature size, it's kind of a much harder to analyze the depths you etch the way. So uh, what kind of a common mistakes people can make is um, people get the etch rate out of this kind of big dimension of the sample. And then just thinking about, oh, uh, uh, under this kind of etching conditions, uh, my etch rate is like this. And when people use the same kind of uh, etch rate to this kind of a nanoscale pattern, it is kind of a way on the edges than you expected. That's all because of this kind of a loading effect. So uh, if you want to get the right kind of edge rate, uh, you had better use the, uh, some kind of very uh, similar uh, samples to measure uh, those kind of edge rate. So uh, one of the effect uh, is an um, as those kind of a, we, we, we have this kind of a side wall angles, some of the ions just come in this kind of a, a wide angles and then hit the side wall and then just coming down. So uh, this kind of a reflection of the ions, ion flux, sometimes cause this kind of a micro trench, especially at the corner of the bottom. So uh, we call that as a micro trench effect. And then uh, this one is also happening um, when you are using the RIE. And then this one is the sample. Uh, this is instead of this kind of a, a cavity structure, uh, I used, uh, um, I wanted to make some kind of a cone structure. I used an uh, RIE for this etching step. And then as you can see, just around the uh, bottom diameter of this cone, I have this kind of uh, nano cavity, nano trench structures. And then that's all because those kind of ions just coming down and then reflect it and then just etch away. So uh, that is the, that is, can be happening. So if you don't like this, uh, what you can do. What you can do is uh, you can just put some edge stuff. So uh, uh, you may have some kind of a loading effect. So in this case of that, uh, these kind of a big openings kind of etch much faster. So uh, uh, these big openings already kind of finish the edge. But since this kind of edge stuff, its etch rate under the same plasma, its etch rate is kind of so slow. So that is why uh, we do not lose too much uh, from this point. And then uh, this is smaller opening patterns just to keep catching up uh, to uh, etch down all the way down to this kind of etch stop. So using etch stop is kind of a pretty good idea uh, for some application, but if you just keep doing that, what happening is uh, those kind of ions started to accumulate on your edge stop uh, layer. So it just uh, localized the electric field build up. So once those kind of localized electric field are build up, those kind of ions coming after deflected and then started to go through the sidewall and then making this kind of unwanted structure. So we call this kind of an effect as a notching effect. So it, this one also can happen in, in the RIE etching. So uh, we, we will talk about the DRIE process. In another word, uh, we call that as a Bosch processing. So I have a question on the edge stuff. So is that insulation layer is post-deposit, pre-deposit uh, underneath the silicon? Right, what you can do is, um, this is, let's say this is a silicon substrate, and you can just deposit about 300 nanometer thick silicon dioxide. And then let's say this is um, like a uh, PCBD 
silicon. So you just, this silicon is not single crystalline, but deposited silicon. Oh, okay. Okay, make sense? Yeah. So let's talk about this kind of a Bosch processing. So uh, when you are singing some kind of uh, pictures uh, for the MEMS devices, they always have this kind of a very straight and perfect kind of edge profiles. How people can make that kind of a profiles? Actually, uh, people are using uh, two cycles of uh, plasma. So, uh, first cycle is on uh, people just uh, deposit those kind of a, a passivation film using the C4F8 or uh, fluorocarbon plasma. So uh, those kind of uh, layers are deposited. Then next cycle, you using an um, uh, SF6 plasma. On the bottom side, there is an ion bombardment. So that is why this kind of uh, 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 regi uh, the layers, organic layers, easily removed, and then you can just remove, you can just etch one cycle, something like this. And then the next cycle, you expose your sample under the C4F8 carbon fluoral uh, plasma again. So you coat another layer of this kind of uh, organic material layer. And then as you just keep Doing that, you are just making this kind of uh, uh, structures, but since your side wall is keep protected by those kind of uh, residue layer, so that is why uh, there's no further etching to the side wall. That's a pretty good idea. But bad news is that uh, this one only works for uh, kind of bigger than one micrometer, I have to say. Because those kind of a cycle cause this kind of a scalloping structural formation. So the side wall is not uniform enough. So it depends on those kind of a cycle exposure time of the, each of the uh, cycle. We will have this kind of a scalloping structure. And this distance from here to the middle of the cone is easily becomes about 200 nanometer. So if you want to have that kind of a 100 nanometer diameter of the uh, column structures that I showed you before, uh, you can just start it with a much bigger mask structure, but your structure is something like this. So the roughness is on about 200 nanometer, and then you will have a very thin 100 diameter of the uh, columnar structure, and you also have an another 200 nanometer kind of a very rough structure. This is the best structure you can get out of this kind of a Bosch processing. One good news is that since uh, this etching process keep depositing uh, polymer materials, uh, during the etching, you don't need a very uh, good quality of the mask material. But it has a limitation on that. One um, possibility you can take is an, um, this is a kind of a, uh, kind of a typical kind of a, a plasma exposure time, 7 seconds of the SF6 plasma, 2 seconds of this kind of a fluorocarbon plasma. So that causes this kind of a 200 nanometer of this kind of a scalloping uh, structures. If you just reduce this kind of a cycles, if then, since you are using this kind of a SF6 uh, exposure uh, cycle, so this kind of a uh, um, cycle m might be much finer, so you will have a much better side wall, something like this. So uh, even though this same structure has a scalloping uh, structure, but 
it looks like uh, much smoother than uh, this one. But uh, using this kind of uh, uh, strategies, uh, those kind of etching time will take forever. So what people are doing is that uh, uh, people started to using a uh, uh, cryogenic process. So uh, SF6 is a um, uh, pure chemical reaction. So uh, when people just cooling down the substrate temperature to the uh, uh, minus 100 Celsius degree or that kind of a very extremely low temperature, if then those kind of a vertical etching is happening because those kind of ions kind of biased by those kind of electric field. So it just keep uh, kind of a collide the bottom of those kind of samples. So, so it just by the physical bombardment, it just keep etch away the bottom. But those kind of uh, 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 fluorines kind of uh, attached to the side wall, it's kind of uh, too cold to make those kind of uh, chemical reaction. So it's kind of a uh, chemical reaction is kind of a uh, very slow. So um, under the similar kind of plasma conditions, just simply lowering uh, your substrate temperature, you can achieve uh, very smooth uh, side walls. And then this kind of a cryogenic process is kind of a very um, idea to making this kind of a very small, uh, it's on about 100 nanometer or smaller uh, diameter of the nano columns to make this kind of uh, uh, etchings. But the thing is, um, it's kind of a throughput is kind of extremely slow. You load your uh, vapors, which is at uh, room temperature, and then cooling down to this kind of a very cold temperature, and then uh, do the etching, and then just to lamp the uh, temperature to the room temperature. So first thing you may expect about uh, this kind of a uh, process is um, your mask materials and then your etch material, it's a thermal expansion is kind of a different, right? So those kind of a, a different thermal expansion can cause some problems. So uh, uh, the problem of this kind of process is that uh, it is not reproducible. So those kind of, a, you by those kind of a cooling and warming up process, you can damage on your uh, mask material all those kind of things happening. So uh, uh, one of the uh, suggestions people are using right now is um, the, the method that I'm using for this one. So instead of uh, having each of the individual cycle of the uh, fluorocarbon and then SF6 cycle, just mix the two gases together and then do the etching at the room temperature. So uh, this is the kind of a trend uh, people started to um, explore. So in this kind of an approaches, you can still etch this kind of a profile at room temperature. So uh, that's the kind of a good advantage. This advantage compared to with the Bosch processing is um, uh, since it does not have a, a dedicated cycle to deposit those kind of polymer layer, so that is why you should be thinking about those kind of edge selectivities between your materials and those kind of a, a mask material. So uh, I introduce you uh, some of the uh, techniques uh, used for the uh, nanostructure uh, etching process. So. Uh, uh, those kind of a process, cryogenic process, is very uh, interesting process, but uh, those kind of process has an advantages and disadvantages. Also, Bosch processing also has done advantages, but it has uh, also very critical disadvantages. So, um, next lecture, I'm going to talking about uh, deposition method in nanotechnology. So we will talk about uh, PVD and CVD techniques uh, during the next lecture. Thank you.